Welcome, my name is Kate. And I'm Mara. And we want to just take a moment to have you become a part of this virtual worship and to give you some instructions so that you can really feel like you're participating with us today. The first thing you can do is you can go get a candle and intentionally light that candle just like we light candles here in the church. And you can set this apart as a holy time and a holy space for you to worship with us. You can also go get some bread right now. And as we consume the consecrated bread here, you can symbolically participate from your own home knowing that you're worshiping with us. The Holy Spirit moves in mysterious ways and, and even in the virtual world. And if you need special prayers, we hope that you'll go to our website at jaxcathedral.org. And under contact, you'll find a way to reach us. May God bless you.
And now please join me in your blue hymnals with hymn number 137, hymn 137. <laughs> Blessed be our God, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse our thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain. Grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, Wait here for us until we come to you again. For Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up onto the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. The word of the Lord. Let us read together Psalm 99, found on page 3 in your bulletin. The Lord is king. Let the people tremble. He is enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One, a mighty King, lover of justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One, Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them indeed. You were a God who forgave them, yet punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God, and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is the Holy One. And now let us turn in our blue hymnals to hymn number 135. <laughs>
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Six days after Peter had acknowledged Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and over, were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Chuck Colson was one of the key advisors to President Nixon. He was a driven, cutthroat strategist and was referred to as Nixon's hatchet man. Chuck Colson was the principal strategist behind the 1972 re-election of Richard Nixon. Colson was hardworking, constantly working, he was driven, and the magnitude by which Nixon won that 72 re-election was a testament in large part to Chuck Colson's drive and intellect and political savvy and insight. And yet, and yet, Chuck later said, when the 1972 re-election was over, I should have been absolutely on top of the world, but instead I found myself staring out of my office window thinking, so what? I was ready to go back to my law firm where I was going to be making a fortune, literally the equivalent of three million dollars a year, and I felt dead, really dead, Chuck Colson said. We live in a culture that tells us we, we need to keep going, we need to keep moving forward, we need to keep fighting for more and more. How many of you have heard someone say something like, I'll sleep when I'm dead? In other words, no time to slow down, no time to listen, no time to hear that still small voice that calls to us. Our culture puts a premium on achievement and success and fulfillment even of our selfish ambitions. But even if we accomplish all of this, there's a danger that we might end up feeling dead, really dead. And the truth is, the world today is not that different than it was 2,000 or even 3,000 years ago. I suspect that Moses felt similar cultural pressures. You certainly remember his story, how he was rescued from a basket, 
by the Pharaoh's daughter who, and who raised him as her son. He grew up into a young man and he certainly felt these same pressures to be constantly charging ahead and achieving and fixing. No time for stopping or slowing down or contemplating. And as a young man, Moses became angry and impulsive and belligerent. And by the time he saw an Egyptian soldier beating a Hebrew man, he acted impulsively and killed the soldier. He didn't know what to do, so he hid the body. And when the Pharaoh heard, out, heard about this act of murder, he sentenced Moses to death. So Moses fled from Egypt and went to Midian. You see, there's a danger in just charging ahead with ever, without ever slowing down at, to reflect on what we want our lives to look like, on the sort of values we want to embody, on the sort of actions that we think would better the world. Chuck Colson certainly never slowed down while serving as the special counsel to the president. But after the 72 re-election, as he prepared to transition out of his government job and go back into the private sector, he drove out to Virginia one evening to see his old friend Tom Phillips, the CEO of Raytheon. Chuck remembered Tom, who he hadn't seen in a few years, as an aggressive, uncompromising, driven businessman. But when Chuck arrived at Tom's home and they began to talk over dinner, it quickly became clear that Tom was somehow very different than Chuck remembered him being. The change was so striking that Chuck asked Tom about it. And Tom responded very directly, I've accepted Jesus Christ and committed my life to him. Now this took Chuck totally aback. He didn't know how to respond to this or what to say. But sitting on, on his front porch that evening, Tom talked about his faith. He talked about the purpose and the peace and the perspective that it brought to his life. As Chuck was driving back into D.C. that evening, he began to think about what his friend Tom had said, and he began to think about the direction his own life had taken. And as he later recounted in his autobiography, he suddenly found that he couldn't see the road in front of him because tears were running down his eyes so thickly that he had to pull to the side of the road to, to remain safe. And there he spent an hour searching for God and calling out to God and praying to God. For the first time, Chuck Colson stopped for long enough to think about that great trade-off that confronts so many of us. Are we going to pursue what we want, wealth or fame or respect, or will we instead focus on listening to God and what God wants, even if that leads to obscurity or diminished influence or less wealth than we could have otherwise possessed. Years later, Chuck would reflect back on that night on the side of the road and say that for the first time I met Jesus. After Moses fled from Egypt, he found himself living in Midian, and there he became a shepherd, and there he was forced to slow down. He couldn't move any faster than his sheep could literally move as they were grazing. And it seemed like his personality began to change a little bit. While caring for sheep one day, he saw a bush that was on fire. But he didn't rush by this bush. Instead, he slowed down long enough to notice something unusual. The bush was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. And because he slowed down, he was able to hear God's voice out of this bush. Eventually, Moses was called to go back into Egypt and then to lead the Israelites out into the wilderness, out of their bondage. And that's where we encounter Moses in the reading today. When God calls Moses to go up this mountain, 
to get these stone tablets on which the law will be inscribed. So Moses goes up the mountain, and I don't want you to miss this detail. For six days on the mountain, nothing happens. Moses just waits. It's not until the seventh day that God appears and begins to speak to Moses. And it takes a full 40 days and 40 nights before Moses finally comes down the mountain. The Israelites have certainly been waiting this whole time. Eventually, Moses leads them to the promised land. But here's the key. Before Moses could do anything great, he first needed to learn to slow down. Here's a little insider perspective on preaching. I'm convinced that if there's a message I really need to hear, there are probably some other people who need to hear this same message. And my confession is I am not good at slowing down. I'm preaching this sermon maybe to myself as much as I'm preaching it to you. If you look at my to-do list, it's kind of built with the assumption that I have at least 120 hours a week that I can dedicate to it every week. And the problem of, of, being, of being so bad at slowing down is that when we find there's something we're moderately good at, it gets exacerbated. If, if you see, for example, that your hard work yields good results, it's easy to start thinking that harder work will yield even better results. And taken to its extreme, this is not a healthy way to live. I suspect that Peter, the disciple of Jesus, probably had similar tendencies towards overwork. When Jesus first met Peter, do you remember what Peter was doing? He was fishing, he was working, and after the crucifixion, when, when the disciples think they won't see Jesus again, do you remember what Peter starts doing? He starts fishing again, he goes back to work. And in the gospel reading that we heard today, when Peter saw Jesus transfigured, literally shining with the light and the love of God, and Moses on one side the culmination of the law, and Elijah on the other, the culmination of the prophets, Peter doesn't stop to marvel at this holy encounter. Instead, Peter, in short, says, I've got a nail gun here, and I can go down to Lowe's and get some plywood, and you all can enjoy this profound and holy experience, but I'm going to get to work, I don't know, building some huts or something. Peter was not good at slowing down. And again, many of us have this same flaw. I know that I do. I'd much rather be doing something than sitting still. About a year and a half ago, my wife asked me if we could go on a spiritual retreat together. And I said to her, it's not a silent retreat, right? And she said, I've read through all the promotional material, and I'm pretty sure I didn't hear anything about silence. So we went, and, and the first day we, we sat down with the group of people, and the priest said, I'm so glad you all have joined us for this silent retreat. <laughs> now, I don't mean to throw Mary under the bus, because she didn't know that it was going to be a silent retreat. She wasn't misleading me. And frankly, I really enjoyed this retreat. But my point is that for many of us, myself included, it can be extraordinarily difficult to slow down or to sit in silence or to take a little break from all our busyness and chaos. Peter struggled with this also. So as Peter was laying out his plan to build these huts, a voice came from heaven and said, this is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Listen. Listen to him. In other words, stop speaking, stop rushing, stop planning, stop acting. Just listen. Just a few weeks ago, I was in a meeting with a couple of the other clergy and staff 
when we began to hear the cathedral bells ringing, serving as a reminder that all of us were late for our next meeting. So someone looked at Deacon Sandra and said, can you pray for us uh, quickly? And Deacon Sandra began to pray. She said, dear God, in this busy world, help us to slow down. <laughs> help us to slow down. In the wake of Chuck Colson's transformational conversion, he had only a few months to slow down before the infamous Watergate investigation was in full swing, and Chuck discovered that he was one of the primary targets of this investigation. So Chuck sprung into gear, and he hired lawyers, and he began to prepare a defense. In short, he began to rush and to plan and to act. He prepared to obfuscate and conceal and deny until one evening when Chuck realized he couldn't be a good witness for his newly found faith if he had to spend his days dancing and dodging around the truth. Therefore, against advice from his lawyers and against advice from family and friends, Chuck went to the, to the, to the prosecutors and confessed his role in Watergate, confessed his crimes, and he was given a sentence of one to three years in prison. And while in prison, he was forced to slow down. He began to lead Bible studies. He began to offer counsel and perspective to other prisoners. And during this time, he began to hear what God was calling him to do with the rest of his life. Upon his release from prison, Chuck Colson founded an organization called Prison Fellowship, an organization that exists to this day. This organization is one of the largest organizations in the world, caring for prisoners and their families, now serving people in over a hundred countries around the world. You see, the great paradox is that while Chuck, while Chuck Colson certainly was not a perfect man, he achieved so much and he cared for so many people who were imprisoned by first slowing down and surrendering and finding that time for silence in his life. So what does this mean for you and me? Chuck Colson went to jail where he was confined to a cell and his freedom was taken away. But because he was forced to slow down, he heard God's plan for his life. And Moses fled to Midian where he became a shepherd. Now that was not a fun job, stepping in sheep poop and sleeping out in the cold. But because he was forced to slow down, he heard God's call. And Paul, while at the transfiguration of Jesus, this holy moment, said, let me get my hammer and some two-by-fours, until God's voice interrupted him and told him to listen to Jesus. Listen to him. Slow down. Hear God's plans. And we're called to do the same thing, to slow down and to listen for God's directions in our lives. Chuck Colson went on to use his intellect and drive. Instead of protecting the reputation of presidents to protect the rights of prisoners. And Moses took his passion, but instead of violently confronting a soldier, began to boldly confront the injustices of the Pharaoh. And Peter took his ambition, and instead of fishing from a boat, and building the foundation of some huts, became a fisher of people and began building the foundation of the church, the rock of the church. You see, we're not called to take the gifts we've been given and discard them or throw them to the side, not even throwing aside our, our ambition or our intellect or our drive, but we are called to stop long enough to pause frequently enough that we can hear how God is calling us to use the gifts we've been given to share God's love, to serve God's people, 
and to glorify God in all we do. Amen. Now let us stand and turning to page five of your bulletin, say together the words of our faith, the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are found on page five of your bulletin. Almighty God, we gather in this house of prayer to give you thanks, to pray for the sick and suffering, and to ask for your light to enter the world. Let us pray together with all of our hearts, saying, Christ, be our light. <clears throat> For the world, that all the nations of the earth may come to honor and respect one another. May we all come to know the peace of God. Let us pray together, saying, Christ, Christ be our light. For the suffering, the hungry, the sick, the refugee, and the prisoner, those who grieve and those who are alone, we especially pray for those effective affected by the destructive earthquake in Turkey and Syria and mall shooting in El Paso, Texas. We also pray for those affected by the train derailment 
in Palestine, Ohio, and the school shooting at Michigan State University. I invite you to speak aloud the names of those in need. Let us pray together, saying, Christ, Christ be our life. Life. For our families, friends, and all those we love, for all those we encounter in our daily life and work, for those estranged from us and for those who feel unloved, let us pray together, saying, Christ, Christ be our life. Life. For the earth, that we may use its resources wisely and be thankful for the gift of all creation. Let us pray together, saying, Christ, Christ be our life. Right. For those who have died, both known and unknown to us, may they receive the joys of heaven. We especially pray for Bruce Hardman and his family. I invite you to speak aloud the names of those who have died. Let us pray together, saying, Christ, Christ be our life. life. Eternal God, help us to slow down so that we may listen to you be guided by you and not by our own ambitions or thoughts or desires. Give us that wisdom that Moses had, that Peter had, that wisdom to slow down. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. You may be seated. It's always wonderful to see a mildly chaotic sharing of the peace. That's a good thing. <laughs> I want to welcome everyone who's with us for the first time or the first time in a while. If you're here in person, can someone or a few of you hold up those connection cards? We have them in the pew back in front of you. If you're visiting with us, I invite you to fill one of these out and either drop it in the plate when it comes by or give it to one of the clergy or ushers after the service. I also want all the regular people to know where they are because if we have someone who's visiting with us, it's good for us to be able to connect with them. And this allows us to, to do that, to follow up and to see how we can support them. If you're joining us online, we're so glad you're with us also. And there should also be a web address where you can let us know who you are displayed at the bottom of the page.
forum, for those of you who are here in person, if you filled out a pledge, uh, a pledge form and requested that you get envelopes, we have your envelopes available in the back of the church. If you're able to pick those up in person, that will save us from mailing those to you. So I'd encourage you to please do that if you can. Also this evening, if you can come back to church at 5 p.m., we're going to have a concert. It's hosted by JU. It will be free. It will be wonderful. And immediately afterwards, we'll have a reception in Tolliver Hall. And in Tolliver Hall, you'll find that we have a new art exhibition that's up. There are beautiful paintings in there. Um, they were painted by a woman who was, I believe, in her 80s, and they're really stunning. So I'd encourage you to come back tonight, come to the concert, and then go to Tolliver for the reception. And speaking of slowing down, it's hard to believe, but next Sunday is the first Sunday of Lent, which means this Wednesday is what? Ash Wednesday. So Lent offers an opportunity to pause and to consider perhaps taking on a discipline, perhaps carving out some time just to listen. Mark and I have decided that we're going to be offering a special sermon series during the season of Lent that focuses on your sacred relationships in your life and how to empower those relationships. And if you would like, you can sign up online to be part of a small group that will meet during Lent and get to know other people in the parish and talk about those topics that we'll be addressing in the sermon. So think about that, pray about those 40 days as perhaps a time to pause and ponder. The night before Lent begins traditionally is a feast time for Christians all over the world. And here at the cathedral, we have an annual Shrove Tuesday pancake dinner where you can stuff yourself with sugar and carbohydrates. And that starts at 6 o'clock, and we want to give thanks for the St. Andrew's Society, the Brotherhood of St. Andrew's, who are hosting that dinner. On Ash Wednesday, there will be services at 7 a.m., at noon, and at 7 p.m. if you want to attend. And tomorrow, our offices are closed in honor of President's Day. I also want to point out there is some detail in your bulletin, a little handout about Episcopal relief and development. If you are, as I am, watching the devastating effects of these earthquakes in Syria and Turkey, um, it is a good thing to respond by giving. It's good for your soul, it's good for the world. Uh, in any amount you can give, ERD has got wonderful contacts and they're on the ground. I trust the work that they do. So if you feel so moved to make a donation, there are instructions there in your bulletin. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days, you sent Jesus to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In Christ, you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In Christ, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country 
where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. are the gifts of God for you. You are the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. I want to remind you that you can receive communion in the old-fashioned way here at the altar rail or there is a socially distant altar in this side chapel with cups on trays. If you are joining us online, I hope that you will break bread with us in your home. After you receive communion here in the church, if you would like a special prayer said for you or someone you love, someone will be here in the side chapel who can pray with you. sweet sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was great that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the My chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me. earth 
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun from bed to shine. But God who's called me here below will be
Our final prayer is found on page 10 of your bulletin. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Our final hymn is number 618. <laughs>
in the name of Christ, alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God, alleluia.